A multimeter at first could seem intimidating, but by the end of this video, you'll know everything you need to know to fully use your multimeter from what every sign means to what they do. We'll also look at some examples and demonstrations on how each feature could be used. Finally, we'll take a quick look at different multimeters and compare their features to decide which is best for you. Now every multimeter has different features, but there are standard measurements and symbols across most units. So let's take a look at that first. First off, we have voltage represented by a capital V. This will allow you to measure voltage of power lines and devices. The power in your home is alternating current, also known as AC and is represented by a wave sign. Then we have DC current, which is also known as direct current. And this is represented by two lines, one solid and the other dotted. You'll usually have two voltage selectors on your meter, one for alternating current and one for direct current. And the most devices that are intended to be plugged in or charged will have a label indicating their voltage and current type. This battery, for example, outputs 18 volts direct current. This jigsaw, for example, has an input of 120 volts. So let's use our multimeter and test this battery. At the top of the battery, we have labels which tells us which terminal is which. After setting our multimeter to voltage direct current, we then place our red wire on the positive and the black one on the negative. If the voltage is not matching the device requirements, there's likely something wrong with your battery or your device. In this case, our range is pretty good and we have a good battery here. Now, alternating current is what you'll usually find in the outlets of your house. So before testing our outlet, proceed with extreme caution. High voltage can cause death and serious injuries. So to test this, set your meter to voltage alternating current. Then place your probes in the socket. When placing the probes, the other could become instantly electrified. So do not come in contact with the probes after placing them in the socket. When testing deadly high voltage like this, Many recommend just using one hand as opposed to two. By using two hands, you're at risk of completing a circuit through your chest, leaving you at greater risk of death from current passing through your body. Depending where you are in the world, you'll read between 100 and 240 volts. This multimeter shows us the result automatically by ranging by itself. Later in the video, we'll talk about manual ranging multimeters, which are these that have a bunch of numbers. Our next feature is ohms. This is a measurement of resistance, essentially how difficult it is for an electrical current to pass through a material. If we place the probes on a copper wire, for example, we'll get a resistance of nearly zero. This is because it's very easy for current to flow through the copper wire. If we place the probe on the rubber, however, we get OL, meaning open loop. This is because little to no current can flow through the rubber, which is why we use it to protect us from the wires and we use it to insulate wires. In other words, it's very difficult for electricity to pass through rubber. We then have resistors. These are devices that help us precisely regulate resistance. To test these, again, it's quite simple. We set our meter to ohms and place the probes on the leads. This resistor, for example, is 21,600 ohms. We'll talk about letter values later on in the video, but this is 21.6K, K meaning kilo, so this is 21,600 ohms. An important thing to mention is that if you're testing a resistor on a circuit, for example, you can and will likely get a false reading. This is because there's other paths with less resistance on the circuit that could give you a false reading, leading you to believe that the resistor is damaged. So you should always isolate what you're testing when possible. The next common feature is continuity. And this is one of the simplest and surprisingly useful features on a multimeter. So this feature essentially just makes a tone when continuity is found with low enough resistance. This feature can be used, for example, if we have a large roll of wire like this and we want to verify that the wire inside is not broken anywhere. Now verifying that the wire inside is connected and functioning is virtually impossible without cutting it open, except with a multimeter using the continuity, we simply place our leads on each side of the wire. If we get a tone, we can verify that this wire is good it's unbroken and it's all good within this wire. This feature is also helpful for finding wire positions. Let's say, for example, we wanted to know what pin this circuit goes to. We place the probe on the circuit and then with the other probe, we touch each one of the pins to see which one it is. We'll finally get a tone and now we know that this pin corresponds to this circuit. These three features, voltage, ohms, and continuity are the most common but we have a lot more things that multimeters can do. Next, we have capacitance, which is represented by this symbol. 
Capacitors are devices that store energy for later use in high demand applications. To test these, we set our meter to the option. And in our case, we have to press the selector button to switch to capacitance. Here at the top, we get a capital F, meaning Farad, which is what we need. Now, before we test this, capacitors are extremely dangerous. Exercise extreme caution. These capacitors can be charged with high voltages that are very dangerous. We have capacitors that are both polarized and non-polarized. Most capacitors should be labeled with their voltage and capacitance ratings by farads. Now, usually farads are measured in the micro scale, so you'll usually have this symbol meaning micro. This capacitor is reading 230 microfarads, which is pretty standard. It will usually have some tolerances. We then have this one, which is non-polarized at 7.5 microfarads with a 5% tolerance. If we test it, we get a reading which is higher, but it is within that 5% range. Moving on, in our case, on the same setting, we have a diode symbol. This is a diode, and this device simply allows for current to pass in one direction, but not the other. To test this, we place our leads on the diode and get a reading. If we reverse it, however, we should get no reading or open loop. This diode is working properly as voltage can pass in one direction, but not the other. If you get a reading in both directions or no reading in both directions, then your diode is damaged. Our next feature is Hertz, or also known as frequency. This is simply the speed of an electrical generator, meaning the frequency of this alternating curve wave. Depending on where you are in the world, you'll have somewhere between 50 and 60 Hertz in your outlet. And as usual, whenever working with electricity, exercise extreme caution. So what we'll do is simply place our leads in the terminals of the outlet and we'll get 59.98 Hertz. Now this is just barely off the 60 Hertz standard of the United States. Many multimeters will also say duty or have a percentage sign. This is known as duty cycle, and this tells us what percentage of the time there's positive current. So when an alternating current is spinning, you'll usually have 50% on and 50% off. In this case, we have dead on 50%. There's other applications where you have square waves that aren't on 50% of the time. Another common feature is the temperature probe. This will either be represented by Celsius or Fahrenheit or a temperature symbol like this. This one's pretty simple and straightforward. It tells us either surface or ambient temperature. Meters with this feature will usually come with a separate probe that we have to connect to our meter, and this should give us temperature. This probe should not be wet. Another less common feature is HFE. This stands for Hybrid Parameter Forward Current Gain Common Emitter. It essentially measures transistors. And in this case, we have to use an adapter and place it on our input. We then get our diode and have to figure out whether it's PNP or NPN. If we don't know what kind it is, we look at the number and look for the data sheet on this transistor, and it'll tell us which is the emitter, base, and collector. We then align our transistor on the adapter and connect it to the board. This should give us a current gain, which we can verify again on the data sheet. Clearly, this is a bit more of a specialized and complicated feature, but it's good to know it's there. Here at the bottom, we have amperage. To test amperage, we have two main options, which is clamp and in series. Most meters will have a separate input for amperage testing. This is oftentimes because it's fused inside and has to take different paths. Also, testing amperage in series has its limitations, from not exceeding 10 amps to not doing it for longer than 10, 20 seconds. If you exceed the limit of your meter, a fuse inside will pop, and you'll need to replace it by disassembling the unit and changing the fuse. So to test amperage like this, you'll have to break the connection of a device and reconnect it with your probes. So I'm going to show you by connecting this in series with my power line to this charger. Now exercise extreme caution and do not repeat this demonstration without a thorough understanding and the necessary safety precautions. So we'll change our probe to the amperage setting, we'll connect the wires and complete the loop with the meter. And our meter will display how many amps are being drawn by the device. And that's how you test amps, but a much safer way to test amps is with the clamp option. To test with the clamp, you must isolate one of the wires. If you put both wires in the clamp, the charges will cancel themselves out and give you no results. To demonstrate this, we'll use our welder, which allows us to place the clamps on the anode, or in other words, the positive wire. We could set our amperage on the device and see if what we're getting is the correct amount. So we'll simply set our meter to amps and put the clamp on the positive wire. And that's how we get amperage readings from a clamp. And of course, this is a much simpler, safer way to read amperage. Another feature common on these clamp devices is NCV, which is no contact voltage. This is a setting that the device will alert you when you approach voltage with the tip of the device. 
This is just an extra safety feature for finding live wires. I wouldn't usually rely on this feature. And those are the most common features on a multimeter. But there's a few more things we have to learn to fully understand everything on a meter. Another important thing to learn is measurement units. Those measurement units are capital M, which is million, capital K, which is kilo, which is 1,000, lowercase m, which is milli, which is 1 1,000, and this symbol, which is micro, which is 1 1 millionth. Rarely, you'll also see a lowercase n, meaning nano, which is 1 1 billionth. We've created a multimeter cheat sheet, which we're giving away for free. This cheat sheet has all the essential information on learning how to use your meter, and it's a quick reference for the values and what each feature does. You can download this for free in the description below. So by understanding these measurement units, we can now understand a lot more things on our meter. For example, this is a manual ranging meter. A meter with no numbers is auto ranging and will automatically switch between values. Though these meters still allow you to manually select the range with this button. But then we have other meters that don't have auto ranging. With meters like this, you have to select the correct range to get a result. And as we can see, we have a lot of our units here. M for million, K for kilo, the symbol for micro, the lowercase m for milli, and so on. Now this may seem a bit complicated, but selecting the correct range is not difficult. So let's use our multimeter and test this battery. To test it, we simply set the value at the highest range. We then turn the dial down until we get a reading. If we get a one, we've gone too far and we need to go to a higher range. And that's it, it's as simple as that. So now you pretty much know everything, but besides this, there's a few more quirks and features of multimeters you should know. For example, on many meters, you have a max, minimum, and average option. When this feature is activated, you simply get displayed the stored maximum or minimum or average voltage reached since activating the feature. The hold button, pretty simple, it just stops the display where it is, allowing you to hold values for reference if needed. Besides this, most meters also have a light, which can be turned on and off. And a final thing to mention is never to exceed the voltage ratings on your device. Now this is unlikely as most ratings go up to 500 volts and it's rare that you'll ever work with anything more than that, but it's important to ensure and know the limits of your meter anyway. And finally, how do you select a multimeter to buy? The first thing to consider is what features are you going to need that were mentioned. Another aspect is whether the meter is true RMS. This means root means square. Now some currents can often have waves that distort the readings and cause up to a 40% error rate when reading. However, meters that have true RMS correct for this, so that's an important aspect to consider. The next thing to consider is whether your meter has auto ranging. This feature greatly increases the ease of use, though really it's not necessary, and if you're just going to occasionally use a meter, then maybe it's okay to go with a less expensive manual ranging meter. Now in the description below, I've linked multiple options from quality to budget, so if you're interested in buying, you can check it out there.